Um, well, my name is Federico Alvarez Irasabal. I um, am, well, I studied, I'm from Argentina, where I studied uh, visual arts and audiovisual communications, which basically is a mixture of film and television with both theory and practice. So my background is in the humanities and um, broadly speaking, my interests are aesthetics, uh, both from well, more a theoretical perspective, but also from an experimental perspective. I can say a little bit more about that later. Um, and well, with um, that background in the humanities and in arts, uh, I um, first before, uh, well, right after my uh, graduate studies, I was for a time active as a media artist. Uh, working a lot with the concept of time and uh, photography and video and interactive uh, objects and art. Uh, and then I moved on, I went back to academia, wrote my PhD on uh, the topic of time perception in video games. And this led me to the current project I'm working in the virtual times, of course, which is the subject of this particular interview. Uh, and here I moved on from the more theoretical perspectives of uh, time and time perception in video games that I covered with my PhD to a more experimental approach where I also can test some of the uh, things I theorized in my PhD. For example, how can time pass faster or slower? Um, and how can we achieve that through um, through video games or, or the interaction with virtual spaces? Um, so that's basically what I do in a nutshell. I, I'm really interested in aesthetics and cognitive science, the combination of the two and uh, looking at the aesthetics of video games and of virtual environments from both a theoretical and um, experimental uh, or with experimental or theoretical methods, I could say. I guess I've been playing uh, video games for many, many years now since I was a child. So video games have with, been with me for a long time now and I've been uh, I just love the medium. I, I think it has so much uh, uh, interest. It, it opened so many interesting new avenues for storytelling, for example, and for games themselves. And um, I've been always, I've always been fascinated by it, basically. And uh, but I didn't really uh, see video games as a potential source of, um, I don't know, work or <laughs> as a way to earn my living in any way as I was growing up, or even as I was I started studying with my studies in university because first of all in Argentina at least at that time but I think generally in the world I'm talking about you know the mid 2000s um, uh, there weren't just as many or any uh, uh, so study programs on video games um, so I studied visual arts and uh, audiovisual communications and was aiming to be, become more of a media artist and in the process of studying, and especially when I wrote um, my my thesis uh, for what would be like the equivalent to the master's thesis in Argentina, we call it there, but we have a licenciatura there. Uh, I came across the game studies field. Uh, my, the thesis I was writing was about contemporary art and how it intersects with hacker history and hacker ethics, hacker in the broad sense of the word. Uh, technology enthusiasts that like tinkering and experimenting with technology and, and pushing the boundaries of technology in a playful manner. And hacker culture is in many ways also the, the uh, cradle of video games. Uh, there, I mean, it's, you could get into an argument of what, what was the first video game, but certainly one of the first was Space War. And uh, this was developed in the mid 60s by a group of hackers in MIT, the original hackers, you could say. Um, Steve, Steve Russell was the first, the guy who, who developed it, the main guy who developed it. And, and through reading about hackers and, well, then space war, uh, that led me into the, the, the game studies literature, which was still very incipient at that time. The game studies field is about 20 years old, and I was writing this thesis like uh, in the late 2000s, like 2008, more or less. Uh, I came across texts like by Ian Bogost or um, um, Gonzalo Frasca, the Uruguayan. And something clicked there. I said, oh, wow, this is also a subject of academic study. You know, so there are those aha moments where you think, why didn't we think of this before? This could be, you know, a 
possibility. And uh, I was already uh, active as a, for a few years as a media artist, but I had really, my interest in going back to academia and theory was growing. And so I decided in the meantime, I came to Germany, long story, um, but uh, I won't get into that. And I decided to pursue a PhD in media studies here in Germany focused on the on game, in game studies and I was already interested in the topic of time through my work on with media arts I was working like I said with uh, different media with video with photography and interactive objects always um, reflecting about the, the perception and the, the notion the concept of time so I brought those two together um, and I thought well how about time in video games there didn't seem to be much written about that. There were certainly some some papers and uh, people who had written about it in, in, in book chapters like Jesper Yule or, um, for example, uh, Jose Sagal. Um, and but I realized there was sort of uh, still a um, gap in the literature, especially concerning time perception. So uh, that's the other thing uh, I combined. Also, my interest in cognitive science is there, uh, which was more of a personal interest. Um, and I said, well, let's take uh, theories of time perception from, from psychology and the cognitive sciences in general, philosophy, etc., and try to theorize what the aesthetics, the temporal aesthetics of this medium can be. And I combined that with formal analysis of the video game, basically. Um, so what are the temporal constituents, the formal elements of the video game that make up their temporality? Like, just to make an analogy, in film you could talk about um, uh, the cut, for example, the film cut as a way of structuring time in a movie. So what would be the equivalent in a video game? That was, um, you know, that's a way to, to phrase that research question that I had. Uh, and then how these te temporal aspects of the video game can also affect our time perception. That's what I, I also theorized that, so to speak, in my thesis. Yeah, so that was my introduction into uh, the study of video games and um, how it started. So this led to a five year long PhD project that ended um, also being published in, uh, uh, by the German publisher Transcript um, in a book called Time and Space in Video Games. So, well, my PhD, as I said, was in um, the temporal aesthetics of video games, probably construed from a cognitive and formalist perspective. And um, so that already put me at a, uh, like in a position where I, I had expertise both in video games and also in time perception and in the psychology of time perception. Um, one of my PhD advisors was Mark Wittmann. Um, with whom I'm currently working now, uh, the Virtual Times Project. He's the PI here in Freiburg, where I'm based. And um, so as soon as the, he and Kai and well, the, the consortium got the, the grant for Virtual Times, Mark uh, called me in as some, someone who has this combined expertise, basically, who knows video games and also knows about time perception. Even though my, my, uh, I have not had previous experience with experimental research, I think he saw potential there in me being a uh, you know, collaborator with him as an experimental psychologist and my other colleague, Shiva Hoshnud, who's a bioengineer, um, to, to design psychological experiments to test also and to test some of the things I theorized in my thesis, for example, right? And, and that he helped me theorize as an advisor as well. Um, so, and our main role here, specifically in Freiburg and uh, is to um, study how virtual environments and video games affect the time perception of healthy participants. Uh, so the broader role of objective of virtual times is to develop virtual environment and games for virtual reality to treat and uh, diagnose psychopathologies like depression and schizophrenia, for example. But um, you also need to research first what happens with um, participants with individuals who do not have psychopathologists, right? Or, uh, um, so that's what we do in Freiburg, basically. And then other teams like, for example, Jülich uh, or Strasbourg, they uh, look into, um, you know, they, they run studies with uh, 
participants with uh, this depression or schizophrenia. Um, so our role is that one now. And as a, uh, within the team, I am basically a video game expert. So I basically, well, one of my main um, roles is to, first of all, pick video games that we can, that I think uh, can be helpful for our studies. And we sometimes run like little pre-studies to test if those intuitions are correct. I also developed, uh, or what you see behind me in the, as a background is a virtual waiting room that I modeled in uh, Unreal Engine. Um, the furniture you see is all assets bought from the marketplace, but uh, well, I, I just built a room and, and uh, uh, the, the lighting there and stuff. And this is a replica of a virtual, of a waiting room we have in Freiburg, or it's basically a, a room that we used as a waiting room in Freiburg. And um, we, Mark had conducted an experiment in this room, so we did the same experiment with a similar room in VR. But I, I can say a little bit more about that later. But so basically my role is that like creating these virtual environments, but also like seeking out of commercial games uh, uh, that can be used in experiments and helping with the design of these experiments, with conducting these experiments, basically from the um, recruitment of uh, participants to the basically the whole process until um, the analysis and the, the writing of the papers, etc. cetera. Um, that's basically what I do. Um, but it's possible in many ways, at least in theory. Uh, I think there's a lot of research that can be conducted uh, to, to how, how time can be manipulated, or time perception can be manipulated with video games. Um, one way uh, and is that you can accelerate the, the subjective passage of time or slow it down potentially as well with video games. Um, and, but also you can uh, at least in theory, I think, uh, change what you or, or influence what we've got a time perspective. Um, uh, like we, the way we perceive time, we see it as having, like we have a present moment, future and the past, of course, right? It's this tripartite structure. Um, and time perspective basically means that the way we focus on time can vary, we can have a stronger focus on the present, for example, or a stronger focus on the future or a stronger focus on the past, right? We always focus on all three to some degree, but some people tend to um, have an increased focus on one of those three time frames, right? To some degree, we all are myopic, temporally myopic in the sense that we have a lot more information about the present than certainly about the future and about the past, right? Um, but some people might be, for example, like overly nostalgic about the past and think a lot about it, right? Or uh, be very future oriented and very goal oriented. So everything they do is uh, influenced by what am I going to do next? Or what, what do I go, where do I want to be in five years, right? Um, so the, those are different in, you know, ways we relate to time as individuals. Uh, that vary from person to person, but I think that can also be manipulated by the situation, right? When we're overly emotional, we get also impulsive, which means we, we focus more on the present, right? Uh, being impulsive means, it's by definition like that, some of the, like being really present focused and, and not reflecting about the future consequences for our, of our actions, for example, right? Um, so I think video games can do that. I, they can... Um, bring us into different uh, temporal focuses. Uh, like if I'm playing a strategy game, for example, let's say Civilization, I might uh, might get into a more future-focused perspective because there, the decisions I take now will have an impact maybe half an hour from now, an hour from now, I don't know, longer periods of time from now. Um, but if I'm playing a game that's fast-paced, action-based, or like say, I don't know, Doom or any first-person shooter, right, Call of Duty, then I'm more likely to be more present-focused, right? It's not the less 30 seconds that count, right? How are reacting the moment to the presence of an enemy and less about uh, strategizing and, uh, you know, thinking about how to administer these resources carefully 
um, and stuff. So there is always some strategizing, but I think some games uh, give us more of a present focus uh, or, a, or, or a future focus than others. So that's another way, for example. And those are just two examples. I don't want to, I could go on and on, but I'll stop here. So while time perception, the, the, the perception of the subjective passage of time um, can be manipulated in, in different ways, uh, but uh, it is, I think, a common experience for all of us that at, sometimes time seems to pass by faster and sometimes it seems to pass more slowly, right? Sometimes uh, time seems to like almost top down to, to a crawl. Uh, think of the prototypical example that I already mentioned of the waiting room, right? That's uh, one of the moments in life where we're like, oh, where is this, you know, when is this going to end? This seems to uh, go on forever. But um, there are other cases where we all, all of a sudden realize that three hours have passed and we have a feeling like, uh, I don't know, much less time has passed, right? Um, and that can be achieved through video games as well. Not by a lot of real-time situations in you know, real, in uh, quote-unquote, but also by video games uh, in many ways. And one uh, prototypical example of, uh, or, or case of time going, passing faster is the so-called flow state. The flow state was studied first and coined, the, the term flow state was coined by, by psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And it's a state in which we're in, um, absorbed by the activity we're uh, taking part in. We're very concentrated. We have the feeling we're in control. Um, we, our, our actions are pretty uh, automatic. We don't have to think about what to do next. And we lose the sense of time and the sense of self. We lose ourselves in the activity, basically, right? And, and we don't think about time and we completely lose the track of time while in a flow activity. And video games are prototypical flow activities. They're very good at eliciting flow and at making us look tra lose track of time, for example. There are many studies that show that we lose track of time during video games, surveys, experimental studies. Uh, and at IGPP, we have also conducted uh, studies uh, this, um, that have shown this and that, that have also provided some of the first quantitative evidence that um, uh, flow states accelerate the passage of time in our experience. And one game we used for this is called Thumper. It's a rhythm game. It's a game where you play with a... Um, well, it's a very abstract sort of game, but it, uh, if Guitar Hero maybe will say something to some people. Um, it's a game where you have a soundtrack, right, music, and you have to react to things that are happening on screen by pressing buttons, by following this rhythm, this, uh, this rhythmic patterns. Um, and we tested uh, Thumper in uh, two experiments already, and it was very high flow eliciting and um, flow correlated highly with uh, uh, a fast passage of time, for example, and with and, and participants thought less about time about time while they were in flow as well. So that is one way that you can um, change the the speed, so to speak, of time in experience with video games by eliciting flow states. But you can also slow it down. And another way in which time slows down is, for example, uh, well, in waiting rooms, right? Um, that's one of the examples I gave. So you can create, and we created a virtual waiting room. And if effectively, uh, time was slowed down in the experience of participants. What happens there is there is nothing interesting to capture your attention. So our attention gets directed to time. We start thinking more about time, and that makes time pass faster, it passes more slowly in our experience. And uh, it seems to drag all of a sudden. Right? So when attention is directed to, to time, it, slow down, it slows down. And the other factor that can slow down um, the passage of time in experience is arousal, emotional arousal. So also, if you get very emotional, then usually time slows down in, in your experience. A typical example of this that philosophers or psychologists would use is a near-death experience, right? Or if we think of an accident, for example, a car accident, that all of a sudden time seems to pass in slow motion. And even your memories of this event seems to be in slow motion. And that is because when uh, yeah, when we're emotionally aroused, uh, time slows down, presumably perhaps because the, 
a moment that's emotionally arousing uh, is a moment that in a way will have a lot of information that's that's important for future for the future so we'll we'll take in much more information that we usually would take uh, in any given moment and that gives us a for example retrospectively then a, 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 um, the memory load associated to that event is bigger so it seems to have lasted longer but also prospectively meaning during the event um, it also slows down um, because we're paying attention to so much information and uh, so arousal also slows it down Video games cannot produce near-death experiences or experiences that where we will fear for our death, but they can certainly arouse us. They can make us anxious. They can make or frustrated, maybe, or angry. Or um, video games can also be emotionally compelling in many ways, like any storytelling, you know, uh, um, cultural device. Um, they can they can touch us. They can make us, uh, you know, feel for characters and stuff. And I think in, the, in those events. Um, we could expect time also to slow slow down during uh, while playing a video game. Yeah, um, well, I think space and time are deeply connected in our minds. Um, we, for example, think about how we talk about time and how we think about time regularly, right? Um, or how we represent time with cultural, uh, you know, artifacts like. Think of the hourglass, for example, right? Sun clocks, those are spatial representations of time. Cal calendars are also spatial representations of time. Um, we talk about uh, events um, coming to us, right? Oh, the, I don't know, the day of the exam is, is coming, right? Or um, we could also flip it around. That would be like the, the a time moving uh, so perspective. Uh, when you say the day of the exam is coming or this day is coming, but also you can say I'm approaching the day of the exam, right? Uh, that would be the ego moving sort of metaphor of time. Um, so we think of time as a, as a sort of a, a substance or something in which we're moving or that moves through us uh, and we give it spatial characteristics in our head. Um, so space and time are deeply connected, uh, I think, psychologically in our minds. Uh, I'm not talking about physical time here, even though I'm sure there are connections. Physicists will talk about space time and all that. That's not my area of expertise. So everything I'm saying has to do with the way our minds construct time um, and not physical time. Um, and I think there are many ways, um, very interesting ways in which we could analyze um, space in video games that could have an effect on, on time. Um, like for example, first of all is the, the question like, why do we even perceive time while playing a video game? And I think that that's a um, matter of basically perceiving contextual changes. Right? The way we perceive time is we see things change around us. Um, and then our minds will assign event A, you know, we'll say, well, event A happened before event B, for example, right? And event B before event C and so on. And, and we give that a temporal order, a structure, and that, that's how we arrive at time in a way, or, or at this temporal structure. So when games show us events through the you know, output peripherals of the computer, video games uh, show us these events like uh, through the screen or speakers, right? We hear sounds and, and see you know, animations um, move on, on screen. And those sounds and, and animations and movements and changes of state and of the screen are events that we can order in time, right? So the event would be, in that case, uh, like the building, the main building block of, of time um, while playing video games. And so already there, the, the, the game designers have a, the, the main tool with which they will start um, creating time in the, in the mind of the, of the player, basically, by deciding which events they will include in the game. Um, but also these events have a pace, for example, uh, so how fast or slowly something moves on screen, right? Uh, um, that will also change our sensation of time in a way. Um, and for example, time can cycle. And in video games, you have cycles like the, the day-night cycle, for example, right? Or animation loops. But the day-night cycle is a very, it's a, also a great example, I think. It's, um, it's something that happens also in real life. But games like Grand Theft, Grand Theft Auto or Red Dead Redemption or The Witcher 3, all these big sandbox games have day-night cycles, uh, right? Where there's, there's um, they're of course much quicker than our day-night cycles in, in the real world, but 
but sometimes it's night in the world, so then it's morning, then it's noon, then it's afternoon, etc. Those are also ways that give some sort of pacing to time. Um, and, and it's also spatially represented in a way, also by lighting conditions and many other effects, but it's also spatially represented. Uh, then you have uh, things like navigation, right? Like you can design space in certain ways. Uh, that will also, in a way, affect the way uh, we perceive time. We navigate through space, right? So how fast or slow we can navigate through space will also, I think, affect our, the way we we, uh, we sense time. Um, and I mean, there are many other ways, but I think also a very important way is uh, through objectives, right? Uh, that's a, maybe a higher level order of in game design that uh, on top of the, the spatial design and the events that you see, video games also give you things to do. Uh, I have to go from A to B, or I have to kill all these enemies, or I have to find this particular object or whatever. And objectives are nested within each other and um, they, this relates also to what I said before, they could be, for example, um, they could give us a more of a present orientation or a more future orientation, right? Those, those objectives are very, very, uh, uh, I think that you have to do right now, like survive now, and we're shooting enemies at you and you have to survive while those enemies attack you. Or like, oh, plan your civilization and, uh, you know, uh, administer all resources and your, your um, um, you know, the population in your cities has to be happy and, um, you know, but you have to have, you have to have enough food and uh, cultural entertainment, but also watch out because there are enemies around you that want to conquer you, and that will give you a different way to think about time, you know, and uh, to relate to time through those objectives and those ways to relating to this virtual space. So I think it's very complex, and there's a lot of things to study here that haven't been really studied in depth so far. I think I've theorized all of this in my PhD thesis, but I think I've already only scratched the surface, or like uh, what I did was like uh, try to set like a based on my own research, but also based on, on previous research that I try to summarize and, and, and bring together within my PhD thesis, try to, to lay the groundwork for what could be a lot of future research as well. Um, so I think I, I don't know, those are some ways in which space, the, things I, the way things are, are structured in space and organized in space uh, can um, affect our time perception. And with objectives in the case, most precisely, I think, uh, the, in the case, in the sense that a lot of times in video games, the objectives just start at point A and move on to point B, right? And uh, so one simple example would be like, well, the further away point B is from point A, the longer it will take you to get there. And depending on what happens in between point A and point B, uh, your perception of the time between those two points can be a lot, a lot different, right? Depending if you're in a state of flow during that time, right? Um, because it's a very I don't know, it's a game that engages you all the time with, with challenges, or if it's a game like, I don't know, I'm thinking right now, um, Graveyard from Tale of Tales, uh, which is a little game where you play this old woman and you start at the entrance of a graveyard, it's all in black and white, it's very quiet, and you play this old woman who works very, very slowly. And you have to go through, walk down a path until you reach a church and then sit down on a bench. And when you sit down on a bench, then the music starts playing and then the lady passes away. And that's all the game and nothing happens between point A and B. More than you're in this graveyard and it's it's a beautifully crafted scenery. You take it in, um, but I think it puts you in a more contemplative state that if you were being challenged by the game in a significant way, if you were running fast through that uh, graveyard, in this case, you're walking with a cane very slowly and for many players, that might be even a boring experience, which I don't think maybe, which I don't think it's bad necessarily for the game. I think it's interesting because boredom puts you in a very uh, self-reflective way, makes you think more about time. And the game is about time. It's about the end of someone's life, someone's time on this planet, you know? Um, so for example, I think that game uses space and motion through space in a very interesting way that can affect time perception and that can bring you closer to the thematic, uh, focus of the game. So anyway, but that that was a little bit of a rant about different ways uh, in which space can affect the time perception. I think there are many others, um, but I don't want to go on and on for ages. Yeah. Mm. yeah. 
Yeah, of course. Yeah, they, uh, I've analyzed this, like I said, in my book, uh, Time and Space in Video Games. Uh, and yeah, for example, one of the chapters is about how you structure game time, game time, game time within the video game. And there I have a, like a typology uh, where I, I analyze certain elements uh, from events, moving on to how the space is designed to then how our objectives are set in games and how all those things can, can uh, structure the time within a video game. But on, then also I move on with this typology also with, through the book to analyze how these elements can also affect our time perception. Well, um, there are, you think, uh, the project itself is challenging. It's in, but what makes it which makes it very interesting to, to figure out right, what are the, the best ways to to manipulate time perception to achieve what we want to do, which is ambitious, I think, right? Uh, um, to treat psychopathologies and diagnose them the manipulation of time perception it's something that's never been done before with virtual environments or in any way as far as i'm concerned i shouldn't i should never say never because you never know but <laughs> um it hasn't been done much at least that's what that i know um but so yeah i think it's we're, it's groundbreaking in many ways and that's always challenging that's uh it meets you with a lot of question marks with a lot of um um uh, yeah, there, all of these questions that need to be answered and that uh, you have to figure out also to ask the right, the right questions and, and the ways to, to answer them. And um, that's certainly very challenging and, uh, and exciting about the project. For me personally, it's also challenging because it's a, or it has an additional challenge because it's a, a shift from the previous work I've been doing, which was more theoretical, more, more in the humanities, even if I've already mixed theoretical approaches with cognitive science and psychology had never worked experimentally before. So that is a personal challenge for me, which I'm happy to undertake because I always thought, I always wanted to do it and, um, or at least for a long time, I've wanted to do it. And um, I think uh, the humanities and the natural sciences have to come closer in many ways. Uh, they aren't as close as they should be. And I think there's a lot to, to gain from closer collaboration between humanities scholars and uh, natural scientists, experimental psychologists, neuroscientists, um, especially when it comes to my field of aesthetics. And, but, but in many cases, I think. And um, as a humanities scholar, I wanted to, to learn the, the methods of um, natural scientists and experimental methods to be able to, to combine them myself also right? during this project, but also in future projects as well. So that, that's a personal challenge that I um, undertook as becoming a part of this project within the, the more challenging, the already challenging framework that, that the project sets it of figuring out really how to manipulate time effectively with, um, uh, with, with virtual environments to reduce the symptoms of depression, for example, and schizophrenia, which is already a very challenging time undertaking in and of itself. Yeah, well, like I said, our goals are certainly to um, add IGPP, uh, at least to to understand how virtual environments manipulate or can manipulate and uh, modify um, the time perception of, of healthy participants. And for that, we well, some of the challenges are to find well, what are they? How do these um, virtual environments have to look like to generate the effect that we want? Right? If we want time to speed up. How do we make sure, or how do we design something, in this case, a, a virtual environment that would speed up time? So maybe one of the things we considered, and I think we've uh, found that it works in a few studies, is that, well, the, this virtual environment in particular has to be game-like, has to be a video game or have, have game-like elements, sort of like this video game Thumper that I mentioned before. and. Um, but then again, not any, every video game will at least it flow in every player. Um, and some video games are better than others overall at eliciting flow, right? Uh, and you want this game to be accessible to most people, even those who haven't had previous experience with video games, which is also a big challenge. 
um, because we don't want to just treat gamers, of course, <laughs> uh, with uh, um, with uh, this project, but also but also everyone, right? Um, so, for example, one thing that Thumper does great that we found that can help is that it's a game that you play with a button, with just one button and then one of the, the thumbsticks, right, in the controller. For those who don't know where controllers are, they usually have like buttons that you press and thumbsticks, which are little sticks that you can wiggle like, like back and forth, like up and down or to the sides, right? Um, and you just use one thumbstick and one button and that's it. And so pretty much anyone can pick up the controller and start playing Thumper. And uh, um, because they don't have to look down to see, oh, where does my thumb need to go now? Because the thumb always stays on the same place. And um, but Thumper also fulfills one of the um, sort of uh, well, what, what's called in game design Bushnell, Bushnell's law. Bushnell is the founder of Atari, and he said allegedly that um, games, good games, should be easy to play but hard to master. And that's what Thumper is like. Not every game is like that. And some games are great and have very, very steep uh, learning curves, in, at least in my experience. Uh, that's what I found. But um, I do think that that's one characteristic that many great games have, that anyone can basically pick up a controller and start playing it. I think one other example is Tetris, for example, right? Um, you can give it to your grandmother and she'll instantly know what to do. And of course, they won't play as well as someone with experience, but but they will manage and and then hard to master means that these games offer enough depth that um, you know even experienced players will have a challenge with the games um, and Thumper does that as well. It gives you options in which you can challenge yourself further than um, than people who have no experience with games. Like um, there are, for example, in this in Thumper, you play like a little bug that a beetle that moves forward through a track automatically. And in, on this track, there are lights. And whenever these lights are beneath the bug, then you have to press A or, or a button, basically. And with an Xbox controller, is A. And then you hit those lights, and then you get points for those lights. But if you don't hit them, don't press anything, or press too early or too late, you don't get those points. But nothing happens, then you just continue playing. So an experienced player can focus less on those lights and more on other th obstacles in the game and, and challenges. Whereas a, and just, you know, for an inexperienced player, the objective can, can be just, oh, I need to get through this level. But for a more experienced player, the objective can be, I need to get through this level with the highest score pos possible, right? With hitting all the lights. Um, so that's one way of several in which Thumper offers this, this, uh, this depth that, um, that um, makes it harder to master for those who are seeking for more of a challenge and have more experience. So that's one way. The other way is, uh, I know we want to figure out, for example, um, uh, how to diagnose depression, right? Another, and then, then for that, maybe waiting rooms are more interesting, but that's something that still, we still have to figure out, so I can't say much about that. But that's basically, I think, one of the main challenges that we are tackling here in Fiverr. It's like, okay, what does this uh, game environment has to look like in Fiverr, but other teams are doing it as well, of course. Um, and what, how can we achieve the desired effects in the best way possible? Um, yeah, I think it is. I think it's already happening in some ways. Um, there's still a lot of research to be done and, and a lot of work to be done, but there are some at least good, um, there's evidence at least that points in the right direction saying that the video games can be used for, for the mental health uh, interventions. Um, I think in the, the area of um, uh, VR especially and um, exposure therapy, that's already a field that's ongoing. And I think, well, SIOS, you are doing a lot of this and it's a good example of um, how this technology works, like VR works for exposure therapy. Exposure therapy being like, I don't know, if I'm afraid of heights, then I get exposed to heights, right? And I, I learn how to cope with this fear through exposure to that fear. And VR, of course, helps, uh, provides, uh, it's a great technology for this because it's, it really fools our mind into thinking, oh, this is really happening, while we know that it's a safe environment. Um, so it's a perfect setting to at least start um, being exposed to what what uh, 
we are afraid of, whether it's heights or I don't know, driving or flying or whatnot. Um, the, the, I know we could we could argue if in this case we could, we're talking about video games and mental health, um, or just virtual environments and mental health, and we cannot talk about video games. But that I think that's a semantic discussion that can be had, but it's, um, which might be important. But um, uh, it's at least a hint that virtual environments already have potential for that, and not not only potential, but are already helping. Uh, um, but also, like we have research. Uh, in the area, for example, of emotion regulation, and especially with regard to anxiety, um, Savella Granik and her lab have uh, um, designed games, very interesting games that help adolescents, for example, cope with anxiety. There's one game they have designed called um, Mindlight, which I think is still, you know, they're still, they're still conducting research on that. It, I think it's not, uh, there's no definitive evidence that it's a, um, uh, to, and that it's not really being applied as an intervention yet, um, but it's a good sign that video games can work. And the, I think the, the way that game works is that, uh, well, players, while they're playing the game, they also have, one, I think, one or two electro electroencephalogram uh, that detects if they're anxious or not. And if they're anxious, the character in, this, in the game has a light. I think the light is also hanging from their head in some way. Um, I don't remember exactly, but the main point is that when they're anxious, this light dims and the game becomes darker. And the enemies in the game or the characters in the game become more and more uh, a threat for the player. And if you, you know, control your emotions, learn to cope with this anxiety, the light bright shines brighter and the enemies stop being a threat or these other characters stop being a threat for the, the for the character, for the player character, um, so that game is designed to, to help as an intervention for to learn how to cope with anxiety and fear. And there is already some evidence coming from from the Isabella Granik's lab that that helps. Um, and um, there is some evidence also from another study. I'm blanking now on who the researchers were. I think it's a German group. But they test. They used a game called Boson X. It has similar characteristics to Thumper, um, the game we used. But it, it's a game in which you're running through basically a tunnel, and you have to jump through gaps and do different things by pressing just one or two two keys. Um, and they show that regularly playing this game uh, helped patients with depression reduce symptoms like rumination, for example. And um, I mean, the, the, the hypothesis working working with as well is that when you enter flow states regularly, this could reduce um, uh, symptoms of depression because flow states are very antithetical to depression, right? Um, in the sense that when you're depressed or patients with depression report, for example, a, a very slow passage of time that they have no future, that they Feel that they they don't have control of their over their lives, so they're very stuck in time, and they're very much also focused on themselves in a very negative light. This is what rumination is, right? When you think a lot about yourself in a very negative light, and in a flow state, you lose track of time. You feel you're in control, and um, and you lose yourself in the activity. So you don't think about yourself uh, during a, a flow state. So we think and hope that this could also help as an intervention for patients with depression that could help reduce their symptoms and uh, help as one tool in therapy to, um, to, um, yeah, to reduce symptoms of depression. So those are some ways in which I think video games have a, a potential for in the, you know, as mental health interventions. Mm -hmm. uh, time, I'm sorry, the word? Mm -hmm. A tight give up. Mm. Mm -hmm. No, of course. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but it's not necessarily, I wouldn't use probably the word reset, but it does, it just makes you forget about time. And um, um, so if you're like, think of opposites, right? If you're uh, very bored, then all you do is think about time. When you're waiting for the, the doctor to call you into the, for the appointment or where you're waiting for the water for your uh, you know, spaghetti to boil. It, it seems like, the, you know, it's like a, like the idiom says, a watch pot never boils, right? It's because you're waiting for a certain event to happen. And that event, that, that time between this now and that event is empty because you're just waiting for that to happen. So you're very focused on time and, oh, when is this going to happen? And uh, when is this waiting period going to end? And so time is very much at the center of things. And, and, um, and also you might become is also emotionally aroused, which is because we become impatient and a little stressed. And that's also one of the aspects that slows down time experience. It flows since you lose track of yourself and of time. And uh, by losing track of yourself, you're not thinking anymore uh, or perceiving directly so, so intensely your emotional states or your internal states. And you're not thinking about time. So your attention is directing somewhere else. Then time flies by and um, but that, that's basically what happens. So then you come back out of the flow and say, oh, say, oh it's, it's night already and there's many hours have happened. I didn't even realize I was hungry and, or I need to go to the restroom. And um, I don't know if you could say that's resetting time uh, because I mean, there are different mechanisms of time. Like for example, we still have like a biological clock, circadian rhythms. Those keep going. It doesn't matter if you're in a flow state or not, right? There are different levels in which we, our, our body and our minds uh, sort of process time. Circadian rhythms are day-night sort of rhythms, right? They're our sleep cycle, right, is controlled by circadian rhythms. At some point, we just become sleepy, and uh, that's synchronized with lighting conditions outside, right? And um, and it has a certain pattern, like about, about like 25 hours, and um, so uh, that keeps going, uh, whether you're in a flow state or not. What, what happens if, if you're in a flow state, you might not be so aware that you're becoming very tired, for example, right? And they should have, you should have gone to bed probably already um, until the, really your, your sleepiness starts really becoming obvious because you start like, playing very sloppily or, uh, or even your eyes start closing. I'm sorry, maybe that siren came into the sound. <laughs> That's why I stopped. I should have closed the window. Um, uh, anyway, so yeah, I think, uh, so that's why I, I hesitate to use the word reset in this context, but it really does make you forget about time. Uh, you don't think about it. On some unconscious level, your mind is still, you know, um, uh, um, processing time and this biological clock is still going. And you still, while you're playing, you're still timing your moves and your, your um, decisions with what's happening around you and in the environment. So there's also some timing and some time perception that's happening there. And you might still have a time perspective, right? Like, a, like I said, so time, the way it works in the head, it's not just one mechanism, it's many mechanisms. And what you forget about when you're when you flow, it's the passage of time, right? Is how fast or slow time is passing. You forget about that part of time. Um, so time seems to fly because you're not thinking about the passage of time which is one of the many mechanisms of, of time. Um, here, I'd like to paraphrase the philosopher Daniel Dennett, who says consciousness is not a, a trick, it's a bag of tricks. I think time perception, which is a part of consciousness, is also not one trick, it's a bag of tricks. It's many tricks, many things that the mind does. And when we talk about time perception in general, we're talking about many things, um, not just one thing. So you have the passage of time, you have timing exercises, you have so if you know uh, the simultaneity and, and um, sequencing, though that's also there's other mechanisms. The passage of time is another mechanism. So uh, some of them are still going while the passage of time it's 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 not really something you're paying attention to. Right? That's the other thing. Some some of the mechanisms might be unconscious, while others we could pay conscious attention to sometimes, and then sometimes we don't. And the passage of time is one thing that when we pay attention to it, it seems to pass more slowly and we will stop paying attention to it, uh, we lose track of it. And uh, all of a sudden, when we start paying attention to it again, 
we realized that it, that that hour we weren't paying attention to time seems to have passed extremely fast. Uh, I think I mentioned them a little bit already. I mean, we've had, uh, so far we've run and completed three studies. Um, and the first was a study with Thumper, in which we had people play Thumper. Thumper can be played in VR and on, on a computer screen, a normal computer screen. So those were our two conditions. So a group was playing in VR, the other group was playing on the computer screen. They play for 25 minutes each and then we asked them questions about time perception and flow, etc. We found that players who play Thumper were on average on very high levels of flow. So it worked very well for both gamers and non-gamers. We had a mixed sort of, uh, you know, pool there of participants with some had some experience, some had a lot of experience and some had almost no experience with video games. Um, and on average, all of them were in flow and we found strong correlations between uh, flow states so with, and time perception that the uh, more intense the flow state, the faster time passed in the experience of players, the less they thought about time also. Um, and also the better they played. They uh, had higher scores overall if they had um, higher flow, uh, if they experienced a higher level of flow. And that's also a common finding with flow. It's it's state where where you perform very well when you're in flow because motions you know are coming automatically and you don't need to think about what you have to do so it, it's a it's a state that commonly correlate with, with correlates with peak performance so we find all that and we gave like i said i think it's some of the first quantitative evidence i think previously i know of one other study that provided quantitative evidence of um, a faster passage of time while in a flow state. And we also provide evidence of support that players thought less about time. Um, we didn't find uh, a lot of differences between 2D or well, like we call it 2D playing on a computer screen and VR, um, other than the VR players um, had uh, a more presence, which is to be expected, a stronger feeling of presence in the virtual environment, right? No surprise there. and. Um, that they played better as well, slightly better, even though um, performance correlated with, with flow, but also the, if they played in VR, they tended, they did play significantly better as well. And that's, we think because, uh, well, Thumper is a game where you have to use your depth perception um, to estimate the velocity of objects coming onto you and how far you are away you are from them. And in VR, you have stereoscopic vision, you're using your both eyes to, to you know, to be able to see in the distance. And, um, that naturally helps with uh, assessing, you know, the distance to objects and stuff. So we think that's what what made players um, play better. We don't know; it's speculated, but we we I think that that's a reasonable explanation for that. And that that was this first uh, Thumper study, which has been already we have already submitted a paper to a journal. It has been accepted, um, and then we did this experiment with this waiting room that you see behind me, and. Um, this waiting room is a replica, a VR replica of a waiting of a room in the at the institute here, the Institute for Frontier Areas of Psychology and Mental Health here in Freiburg. And in 2018, Mark Wittmann, the PI in Freiburg, conducted a study there with other researchers. Joanna Vitovska um, was the, the um, first author of that paper, and they. Um, had participants come into IGPP, they came into this room. IGPP are, is the institute, right? That's uh, the initials in German for the institute. And um, they told them, wait here, the other participant took a bit longer than we expected because we had some technical problems. Um, so I'll be right back um, and we'll start with you, with, uh, with you in a minute. And so the, the experimenter left the room, but that was already the experiment. And they came back after seven and a half minutes and then the participants had to answer a few questions about the waiting time. Um, and what they found is that the participants were bored <laughs> during this waiting time, unsurprisingly, but also like the more bored they were, the slower time, time passed in their experience, the more they thought about time. And they also found a relation between their capacity for emotion regulation and self-control 
uh, in that the better they could e regulate emotions and engage in self-control, the less bored they were and the faster time passed for them during this waiting time. And what we did is basically import all this design to VR. We created this room in VR here behind me and we had the participants come in, put the headset on, the VR headset on, and we told them, oh, well, wait here. I'm going to go to the other room to start the game. And, and um, so please wait sitting down and don't take off the headset. We left the room and came back seven and a half minutes later and asked basically all the same questions. And um, we found very similar correlations between boredom and time perception. The, they were very bored. Uh, during this uh, waiting time and the more bored they were, the slower time passed for them, and the more they thought about time. Interestingly, and contrary to our expectations, they were even significantly more bored in this condition than in the real waiting room, and time passed significantly more slowly for these participants than the participants in the real waiting room study. And we expected that to be the other way around. We thought at the beginning, the beginning um, virtual reality is such an interesting new technology, you know, it's, you put the headset on, especially if you haven't tried it ever before, which was the case for most participants. We expected that, but also corroborated that afterwards. Um, it's like, wow, this is so immersive. I feel like I'm inside this environment. This is so crazy. Uh, and so we thought this novelty effect would, would make the room more interesting than the um, real waiting room and therefore the waiting time less boring. And uh, their feeling of time, you know, of the passage of time to, to be faster. But it was the opposite. And how we now explain that retroactively and, and of course, speculatively, is that um, a virtual room generates other expectations. Um, you don't expect anything to happen in a waiting room, in a real waiting room, whereas in a virtual waiting room, anything can happen. And we associate maybe these environments with um, with entertainment, right? And I don't know, and if the roof could fly off and a dinosaur could, could come in or aliens or whatever. It's a virtual room. Nothing is off the table. Um, so maybe the, those expectations um, made the, the whole experience feel more boring than it was uh, because they expected more from it. And also, we didn't find any correlations between uh, or a relationship between their uh, capacity to self, for self-control and emotion regulation and boredom and time uh, perception. There was nothing there to be found uh, as they found in the previous study. And this is maybe also because the, as being in this uh, environment, that's kind of novel. Um, maybe you cannot so easily uh, apply the strategies we usually apply for coping with boredom and, you know, a slow passage of time that we would use uh, in in reality. Uh, so maybe they couldn't engage with those strategies, and um, and that's why there was no relation to be found there. But we, we all this is just uh, speculation after the fact. Um, and then we conducted a third study, which in which we. Um, Test it again with Thumper, this time only on, with a, on a computer screen, but with an EEG cap and an electroencephalogram. Um, we are still working on that, um, the analysis and the, the paper for that. Uh, and if you interview my colleague Shiva in the future, I think this is, it's better if you discuss those results with her because she's more specialized than I am and she's a bioengineer and neuroscientist. So she could say a lot more and in more detail about those results and since they're still you know fresh and we're working on them um i think that those are better for him for a future talk well thank thanks very much for the interview this was a lot of fun and looking forward to seeing this in online even though i don't look to seem like to hear to myself speaking but <laughs> i'm always happy to share what we do here and to you know to disseminate it and, um yeah, and to talk about what we're doing and if this comes to the ears of other researchers that are interested in our research, please, you know, um, uh, contact us and reach out. We're happy to discuss these things, to collaborate. There are many ways, many channels through which you can reach out and happy to chat about these things anytime. <laughs>